Hello and welcome to everybody for joining us. My name is Juan Garcia with the Irvine Ranch Water District. Uh, welcome to Composting 101. Uh, the presentation is going to be starting in a little bit. Um, first thing is if you need to ask any questions, uh, please use the chat feature to submit questions after the workshop. We'll be collecting all those questions and answering them and emailing everybody so you all have them uh, for your reference. Um, during the presentation, uh, we will just keep everybody muted. And if you do have questions, once again, just type them into the chat feature. Uh, somebody should be able to address you, but we will be addressing all of everybody's questions at the very end. We will have the presentation and host the Q&A the, towards the end of the, of the presentation. Um, after the presentation, I will be emailing out some handouts, the very informative handouts that were provided by the UCCE Master Gardeners of Orange County. Um, you can email us with any kind of questions or comments at rightscape.irwd.com. Also, if you notice, we do have a hotline where if you need to talk to a representative, there is one live, ready, and available to chat with. So, um, with that said, let me introduce our presenter for today, Mr. Greg Stevenson. He's a fantastic presenter. Um, he's a member of the Master Gardeners of Orange County since 2013. He's a certified master composter, expert in growing all things edible, using a wide variety of methods, uh, teaching edible gardening, and related topics for many years. Uh, Greg is a book of knowledge, and I am really excited to have him present uh, on composting today. So, with that said, thank you, Greg. But let's let's go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Juan, and we'll just go ahead and get started. Welcome to everybody to Composting 101, Reusing Green Resources to Restore Soil Health. I promise I will not be reading the slides from here on, but this is just the uh, basic introduction for what we're doing. Now, what we're going to be doing is I'm going to give you all the who, what, where, when, why, how, and so on of composting. I'm going to talk about a variety of solutions because what is recommended by the University of California doesn't suit people in particular in the Irvine area like a glove. So we have to adapt and we have to modify for ourselves. I'm one of the few people that can do what's called hot composting. We'll get to that in a little bit and that's because i grow so much on my property but most people have very small yards and maybe not a whole lot of vegetative growth in their where they're at so we've got to sort of we'll give you the options and then you'll be able to figure out what works best for you now, you may decide that you want to use compost, but maybe you can't generate your own. Or if you're like me, I generate a lot of compost, but not enough for all the gardening I do. So there are some local sources for very good compost that you can also use, and I do that as well. So besides generating my own compost, I also go to these local sources for high quality compost, which I blend together when I use it out in my garden. And then that's the last thing is we'll talk about some of the things along the way that you might have problems with and how to troubleshoot those. Okay, the formal definition from the University of California for compost is that compost is the biologically active material that results from the microbial decomposition of organic matter under controlled circumstances or controlled conditions. That is a mouthful, but basically what they're saying and the key things here is that it's biologically active. There are living organisms inside this compost and it's from organic matter and it's in controlled conditions. By controlled conditions, if you think about a forest, the forest has lots of trees, acres and acres of trees, and leaves fall down, branches fall down, and they generally decay over time. And the top layer of the forest floor has that rich, earthy smell due to composition, decomposition, and that's the compost. 
but we don't have acres and acres and 10, 20, 30 years to create compost slowly. So we're gonna do it in a much quicker way. And that's what we mean by the controlled conditions. To do it in a visualized sense, we're gonna collect a whole bunch of stuff that's organic, leaves, branches, any other sorts of organic matter. And then we're gonna chop it all up and so that it's just a fraction of its original size. And then we're gonna allow microbes to turn that chopped up organic matter, woody matter into compost for us. And there you can see a sample of some of my compost that I created. And so that's the basic thing. Now, most of you probably have containers like this that you put out every week for the trash collectors. The green ones are used for green waste, the blue ones for recycling, and the gray ones for trash. If you put any green organic matter into the gray compost bin, it will be placed into the landfill in its full bulky form. That first slide or that you saw with that big pile of compost in there, that is how much space it's going to occupy in the landfill. If you put it in the green bin, it gets composted. And as I mentioned, that you saw that when it gets chopped up, it's a lot smaller than it originally was. So that decreases the volume quite a bit. And then when it's composted down, it actually is about half of what the chip version of it is. So it gets very, very small. And the stuff that you put in the green bin also goes into the landfill for the most part. To, it's used to cover as a covering after they put a bunch of trash down, they then put a layer of compost down, but the volume that it occupies is a small fraction of what it originally, the original size was. So it's very beneficial to put stuff in your green waste bin in order for it to be composted commercially, even though you're not gonna be able to use it, uh, even though you're not doing it yourself and it's not actually used for spreading around into gardens and stuff. And the reason for that is compost depends, the quality of the material used for the compost determines the quality of the compost itself. And people will put stuff into the compost bins that are on the curbside pickup that may not be the highest quality. They may have a lot of pesticides and different things like that. If uh, a lot of lawns and a lot of bushes, ornamental bushes in particular, they'll have a lot of pesticides used on them. So they don't necessarily, we can't, we don't have any quality control on the curbside stuff. So that's why it's used primarily for the landfill. Some of it's brought out to the desert where it's used in a long-term soil remediation. But the main benefit of putting it in the green container is it decreases the impact on our landfills. Now, I do want to mention one additional thing. Some things, even though they're green, should not go into the green container. And one of the biggest offenders I've seen are palm branches. Palm branches are long and skinny in that, and the machines that chop up the branches in that for compost have a real hard time with these and they get all they mingle the machinery so things from palm trees from banana plants from other things that have that palm like appearance to them they actually need to go in the trash and not in the green waste it's problematic if you put them in the green waste so try to avoid that if you can now i have five c's on how to compost you collect stuff up, as you saw in that one picture. You chop it up. That makes it smaller so that it can be effectively composted by bacteria. We do the actual compost operation. And then 
we collar or screen it so that we sift out the big pieces from the small pieces. And then we use the stuff that we sifted out. We screened out, we consume it and we use it in our garden. And so that's what our ultimate use is by consuming it ourselves. And doing the composting at home, it's not going to go in the trash. It's not going to go even in the green waste container. So we're going to minimize the impact on our landfills even more. And more importantly, since we control the composting process, we know that we're going to have some really good quality compost to put on our plants. Okay, that collection part, what do we collect? Garden trimmings, leaves, you can use coffee grounds. As a matter of fact, I drop off or take a five gallon bucket over to this little place you may have heard of called Starbucks or some other coffee shop, and they can fill up a five gallon bucket so fast with coffee grounds, it make your head spin. So you can get coffee grounds, they're really great. Fruit and vegetable trimmings, herbivore manures. I don't think many of you have horses or cows at home. Some of you may have rabbits at home, but herbivore maneuver, manures could also be used. It's not as big of a thing in Orange County. You can use shredded cardboard, but you gotta make sure that you remove the plastic tape or labels in it. One of the reasons for screening is if you forget any of that, the plastic will not be decomposed as part of the composting process. So it can be screened out later, but it's best if you can remove it up front. Uh, shredded newspaper, and this is the plain white paper, not the real shiny glossy paper, which magazines normally have. So you uh, that has like a clay type stuff on it, which is not good for composting. So you can use those. I personally avoid these when I do my regular compost, but I certainly use um, them when we when I compost with worms, and I'll show you that a little bit later. But it is an option. What you want to avoid, though, and I'll give you the reasons for this real quickly: meat, poultry, fish, anything that is animal. And the reason for that is it when it decays or composts, it smells. And it'll also attract rodents, raccoons, rats, flies, bugs that you don't really want. It will compost and it does make good compost, but it's not the optimal thing to do in home composting. So best just to avoid it. Dairy or grease, pretty much the same reasons. Dog, cat, and bird feces, third, they don't compost well. Once again, you have the odor associated with it, so you don't want that. Um, you don't want your neighbors complaining about that. Sawdust from treated wood or any treated wood you don't that has chemicals in it that's not advantageous. Arsenic was used for many years, and so you want to avoid that. And if it's got paint or anything like that, you you don't want to have that as part of your compost. Since you're planning on using the compost again. You don't want to put disease. Okay, the the first few items as well. Those are things you also do not want to place in the green waste container. You would place them inside your trash can for the same reasons. They're not things that are good. Hello, Greg. I think we lost audio with Greg. Everybody, please be patient. Hello, everybody. I think we're having a little technical issues right now with Greg. I'm going to 
reach out to him. Please be patient. Hello, everybody. I am talking to Greg right now. He is checking his end, but he will be with us shortly. He's, uh, thank you for your patience, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for being patient. Um, we are still checking this, but hopefully we should be on shortly. Thank you so much. Says connected. Can you can you hear me now? Okay, so let me share my screen again, and then we'll. We got Greg right back, everybody. Thank you. Let me know if that happens again right yep, away. We're good. we're good to okay. go. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for being patient. Let us let us, read, let, us let us keep going. Thank you, Greg. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. Don't know what happened. It just sort of cut out. So um, we were talking about the things to collect, which are mainly stuff from your garden, anything that you might have as kitchen waste, like uh, fruit and veggie trimmings and things like that. Coffee grounds, tea bags are also good. Nothing should dominate. You want an assortment of different items in order to um, get a good compost. And then, so no more than 20% of any one given items. You want to avoid these items, the first items, meat, poultry, fish, things like that. 
if you put them in your compost pile, they're going to smell, they're going to attract rodents and other things you don't want, insects. And they will compost, but it's just not a good idea. They should go in the trash. Same thing with dairy or grease, dog, cat, bird feces, things like that. Anything that's an herbivore that eats plants, that's okay. Any uh, So like rabbit manure, you can compost, uh, but not this. Anything from treated wood, you don't want to put that in your compost pile. Once again, it's got um, bad chemicals that will not be good if you put it on your plants. Disease plants, you don't want to put those. Those can go in the green waste. They don't have to go in the trash, but they can go into green waste because they're going to be used out in the landfill. But if you, you don't want to put anything as diseased where it could spread the disease because there's a form of composting that kills most diseases and most weed seeds, but the average Irvine homeowner can't do that form of composting. And so it's best not to put that in any disease plants. Palms, we talked about corn cobs, those actually go into your trash, not even into the green waste. And then any sort of weeds, uh, just go ahead and put them in your green waste. One other thing to point out is that there are certain viruses in tomato plants and other edible plants that are in the nightshade family, such as your peppers, tomatillos, eggplants, and things like that. Those do survive even in the hot composting method, so those should also be thrown away and put into the green waste as well. Now, there are two types of different items, which we call feedstock, to go into your compost. The browns, which are carbon rich, and they're usually dry, have very low moisture content, and examples, as you can see, are leaves are the most common things. Older tree branches, because the as the tree grows and branches, the wood on the inside is actually dead, and it's the new growth on the outside. So it's a little bit of green, but a lot of dead material. So that's considered a brown. Cardboard, of course, and then anything that you can chip as far as woody type things. If it's the contrast to that are the greens, which are nitro nitrogen rich. And these are needed to start the decomposition process. And good examples are, you know, cut grass. If you put a broadleaf weed killer on your grass, however, to get rid of dandelions and things in your grass, do not put your grass uh, that into your compost because that chemical survives the composting process. And if you put it on your, your nice plants that have broad leaves, it'll end up killing them. So if your grass is, if you have grass and you're not using any sort of chemicals to kill weeds or something on it, that would be safe to put in. Any of those other things we talked about, if it's green. The one additional thing is you actually can add coffee grounds, which even though they're brown in color, are actually very nitrogen rich and an excellent way of an excellent thing to add to your compost pile. And of course, any new green plant growth, the leaves and stuff, new branches are usually green in color or annuals say they're green until they start turning brown. Now, fun fact that anything in grass is a great example. If you leave it alone, it's going to eventually dry out and turn brown. So it'll turn from a green into a brown through a process called denitrification. The nitrogen leaves the plant, leaves the material, and it turns brown, dries out, and that then becomes a brown. So if you're just collecting stuff and leaving it alone, eventually it'll go from a green to a brown. So it's best to collect all your greens just before you start the composting process. But you can always collect and then store it. So what we have is our components whenever we're putting together a compost pile. We have our browns and our greens, and by volume, you want them about equal. This is not rocket science, folks. 
compost will happen. It's just that it's kind of optimal if you have an even mixture of browns and greens. If you have too many greens, and you might even want to have more greens if you have a smaller compost pile because you want to get the temperature up high and the greens will generate a lot of heat if there's a lot of greens, but in a smaller pile, you don't get to the high temperatures that you really want. So by adding a few more greens might actually be a better thing. Besides the browns and the greens, we have 25% of your compost pile be air and this is all the nooks and crannies and stuff between the pieces of what you're dealing with and then water you want moisture this is going to be used by the bacteria to provide the chemical breakdown because this is a living process so you need air you need water just like we need air and water the bacteria need that and it's going to take those browns and greens and break it down into a form that the then can be used by the plants now, chopping is a little hard for most Orange County, Irvine residents because to do it on a large scale, you need something like, this is my wood chipper right here, I properly nicknamed Chip, and you can see what it did with that big pile. It took that big pile and chipped it all up, and you can see in my uh, photo on the right how it chopped everything up into nice small pieces. And this is what you wanna do. You actually wanna have whatever you're putting into your compost pile in about two inch or smaller pieces. Not really, really fine because if it's too fine, the air won't be able to get in and around and the water soaking the sides. But the smaller the pieces are in general, as long as they're not too small, the bacteria are going to be have more surface area to attach to, and they're going to do a much better job, and it's going to decompose faster. If they're not broken up uh, down to this level, that's okay. You just have to figure out ways to make this uh, happen. A good thing is you can use just regular shear, especially on soft green plants. If, if you chop them up when they're green, it's a little better. Uh, you can use loppers on bigger branches, just chopping it into two inch things. If uh, the branch is too big around, you can hit it on a with a hammer to break it into shatter it like into small pieces once you've got your two inch pieces. It's a little bit more work. There's also electrical uh, choppers that are great for smaller plants than the big gas powered ones. They're also quieter so your neighbors won't complain as much. I tend to run this uh, for, for very short periods of time in the afternoon when I, uh, when most people are at work in order to not disturb anybody. But that's, uh, that's what you can do. Of course, if you're using a hammer or anything, you wanna make sure you wear eye protection to as a safety type thing. You also don't want things to be too wet. Now, once you have all this material, you gotta put it somewhere in what we call that a bin. And the classic bin is this one that's right here on the left, upper left, which is a three segment bin. We're gonna be mixing the compost pile. So the two of the bins are just used to, once you fill it up, you wanna move it from one side to the other every few days. So everything in this bin will be moved to like the center bin and then it'll be moved to the back bin. And the third bin is used for collecting in between time. The uh, Another way that you can do it is this bin here is just a circular round bin and it un unattaches so that you can move everything around. The pile will stay pretty much intact. You can move it over a couple of feet away from where the one pile is and just move everything from one side to the other. So you can have just a single bin, but you're moving back and forth, back and forth. There's a lot of, you can build bins out of almost anything. Here's an example of cylinder blocks. Some people will mix, they'll have something that rotates in a drum style and it'll mix it up. Unfortunately, any of these, or even a trash can, they lay it on its side and roll it and have it uh, mix. They're not usually large enough to do what we call hot composting. 
And for hot composting, it needs to be at least three foot by three foot by three foot. So uh, that's kind of a problematic. This is another type of composter. It can be used in um, smaller households. You put stuff in at the top, and then it decomposes slowly, and then you can pull out the compost from the bottom. Once again, you can make your compost out of just about anywhere, anything. Now, where do you put the bin? We need that water, so you want to put it within the reach of your hose, or you're going to have to carry buckets of things. But having a spray hose just to wet down the pile is the best way of doing it. You want to have enough physical room where you can turn the pile. That's in turning the pile means you take the stuff that was on the top of the old pile, you put it on the bottom of the new pile, and stuff that was on the outside of the old pile, you put it on the in inside the middle section intersection of the new pile and so you're you're doing that you don't want to put it on concrete because the can stain concrete concrete generally just a, a dirt surface around the corner out back you can look there or some people compost in the front yard but they make these really really great looking redwood composts or they buy them but those can get quite expensive i've seen composters that cost well over a thousand dollars and to me, that's not where you want to put it. And another thing for me is you put the compost where you can't grow stuff. You might have something on the side or something that you can put in there. This was my first compost bin. Yeah, I made it out of pallets. I found some, the pallets had big slats in it so it wouldn't hold things. You can see like I had just the ones, one bin and then I had what would be like the third bin for collecting just off to the side. I found these sheets of reinforced foam uh, insulation. I put them so that they would go. And I had the compost actually at a slant. So I would go slant it one way and then every couple of days I would turn it and slant it the other way. And I put this underneath a, a lemon tree that I have because nothing would grow under the lemon tree. And so that was just a, a perfect spot. And that's still where I compost today. I just have something a little bit nicer than the bins that I'm using. What I'm using now, you can see the lemon tree right here. And I have these two plastic compost things. These are called geo bins. They, you can f find them online. Um, there's a place many of you might have heard of a little known place called Amazon. You can find them there, Home Depot. I know on their online store carries them. They're about $40 a piece, rounding up roughly. And the nice thing about these is they're flexible, so they'll fit almost any situation you have. You can change the size of them dynamically. And when they're fully stretched out, they will do the three foot by three foot by three foot. So they're, they're perfect for that. Uh, I don't, no endorsement, it just works it just works fine for me, so that's the reason why I use them. However, they do flop over, as you can see here. So I've actually put little rebar stakes. You can buy these um, rebar stakes that are uh, two foot long. You hammer in a, a foot of it, and then you put a pole, either EMT pipe or a plastic PVC pipe, around the four corners, and that way it creates a nice little square for you. Uh, another one, and there you'll get some instructions on how to make this at the Master Gardener's compost demonstration facility. They like using this type that we showed where it opens up and they just simply, it's one inch mesh and then they just move it, unhook it, move it to another spot off to the side and then connect it again and fill it up. Once again, turning the piles that way. So that's um, another way that you, you can do it. Now, <clears throat> There are two basic methods of composting, and it's almost like a continuum in between. The recommended UCC hot thing is an active pile that needs at least a cubic yard of material. That's a lot of material. What I showed you with that big pile that got chipped down, that's only like 25% of what's actually needed to create a, a cubic yard of material. So most of you aren't gonna get that real high temperature that you'll get with 
a nice big pile. And the ideal thing is you want to see with this thermometer that you want this. There is a temperature. This looks like a meat thermometer, but it's called a compost thermometer. And it just has a long stem, sometimes about 30 inches or so long. It goes into the middle of your compost pile. And it should be around, at least in the gray area, 140 or more for three or more days in order to kill all the weed seeds, in order to kill most of the diseases and stuff. And you're not going to get to that level. You're going to be more towards the 120 range with most of the smaller composting techniques. That's fine. It just takes longer and it doesn't kill the weed seeds or the disease plants. So you want to make sure that you don't put those in there. When you use a hot method, it only takes like six weeks to finish. The other one works. It just takes less, uh, it takes longer. And the hot when you have to turn the pile two to three times a week it, to make it at an optimal type situation. With a colder method, you just turn it on your own schedule. When you think about it, you can go out and turn your pile, add water to it when you think about it. You add material as you go along, you just keep doing that and you're not gonna have the same quality product, but it works. And you know, once again, I use something in between Twice a year, I can use the hot method, and in between, I make my pile a little bit smaller. I bring, I have those poles, I bring them in a little closer, so it still goes up and down, so it's deep, but it's not quite as wide as before, and it works fine. Now, after you, after several weeks or several months, whatever it is, when you're ready to use your compost or you want to start looking at it, what you're going to do is you want to screen it. And the simplest screen that I can think of is one that I made. This is quarter inch hardware cloth that you can get from a just a, a regular big box store, a home improvement store, and a two by four by eight, which you cut up into four sections, two by two by two, and then you just nail on the back the mesh and you can sift that and it'll fit right over a wheelbarrow or something like that. And it's a great way to screen out your material. And there's, uh, you can get smaller mesh if you look on places like Amazon and things like that. But the, the main thing is that you wanna be able to screen your material and the big stuff you just put back into your compost bin and you start it over again and the smaller stuff, you go ahead and you put that in your, your garden. The big stuff, uh, when you're using it, you wanna take the smaller stuff and you wanna mix it into the top few inches of your planter beds and that, and that works really well. And the big stuff, you can actually use that out, but you use it as a mulch, and mulch is what you place on top. And mulches are great as well because the mulch will keep water in, keep weeds down, so you're not gonna grow as many weeds, so you can actually have a lot of mulch, so you can reuse whatever you have that way. Okay, now, for a lot of you, you might not have that much plant material growing around, but you might have a lot of kitchen scraps, or at least some kitchen scraps, so this next thing we're gonna be sharing is like the ideal thing for the rest of us. I use both. And that second thing is vermiculture or composting with worms. In order to do this, you don't need much. You can use something as simple as a five gallon bucket or even smaller to get started. Here you can see some person using some plastic tubs. And the nice thing about composting with worms is you can reduce all that food waste that you would normally throw away into the trash. And you can do this anywhere, even if you only have a, you live in a condo or a, an apartment or something, you can do this. And not only does it produce compost, it produces the best type of compost. Worms are like master composters. They really deserve the title. 
the, what they produce, the Burma cast that they produce is about six times more concentrated on average than what regular compost has. And it's more readily available to the plants right away than what you get normally. So for food scraps, this is ideal. This is the best way of doing it. Now, the technical, you can see the scientific name, Icinia fieta, the, but most people just call them red wigglers. They're the most common type of composting worms. You can get um, a thing of them from places that sell, you know, uh, fishing. These are your classic red fishing worms. You can look on Craigslist or in the handout, I'll give you a location of somebody who is in Cyprus, I believe, who uh, has worms locally. There's a couple of places that have worms available locally. They can process huge amounts of organic matter, half their body weight every day. And they are able to tolerate a lot of abuse. And they reproduce very rapidly. So it just works out. You can start with just a few, a little bit, and then you can grow it. I have, uh, I started, somebody gave me a plastic container like this, and it just had some holes on the side. You can see that most of the container is empty. These are the worms that live in that top six inches or top few inches of leaf matter that falls on forest floors and stuff like that. So that nothing needs to be deep. And so I started out, those little orange things are actually what I, the way I feed them. And there's a little known fact, but worms have very small mouths. So you can put whole unused pieces of vegetable matter or whatever in there, but you can also puree it, which I like to do. And when I started out, I didn't have many worms. So I would also take the puree and I would put it in an ice cube tray and I would freeze it so it would keep. And then I could just put out a couple of cubes every so often. Now I use so much that I'm sometimes I have to go to third party sources to get enough matter in order to go. But vermicast is like the ideal compost. So I, I, I do this a lot. Now what I use are these 10 gallon totes, which you can buy at most stores, something that looks similar. You can see how I put a lot of holes. Plastic does not breathe, so you need to put a lot of holes. I do not put holes in the top though. I have mine outside and occasionally rain will blow in such a way that it can pool and drip through the top if I have holes on the top. I have way more holes than I need. But notice that there are no holes at the bottom. There's a lot of literature out there that incorrectly talks about having holes in the bottom. If you have holes in the bottom, it's going to leak out. And if you have so much moisture in the container where you want that to leak out, you've got too much moisture in there. So what you want to do is just have just enough moisture that it keeps the bedding, which we'll look at in a second, wet, but not so much it leaks out. That way you can stick this in your closet if you need to. Dark spaces is exactly where the worms like, but they can be outside in a shady area under a tree if you wanna put there. A lot of people have them in the garage, just a nice container. Now, you can also put them outside. You can also build like a wood container, cover it with some shade cloth, and then inside, people will put the bedding, which you can use as just torn up bits of newspaper or cardboard or shredded white paper. Not the shiny stuff, just like regular compost, but just the and no tape or anything like that. Just that, and you can get your composting there. In my compost is a blend. You can see here, I take both paper bags. There's a garden center nearby that I noticed that they use the bottoms of paper bags to put plants in when they give them to people, but they just were throwing the tops of the paper bags after they taught, um, cut them off in the trash. So I asked them for it and I run that through a 
one of those crisscross shredders and I run newspaper through there. Plus I take some regular compost, the what's been screened to a quarter inch and you can see that in there. And that's a blend that I put together and then I put it into my tub, only filling it about halfway. You see a little ridge there and that's my mark as to how how high I fill it. You don't fill it all the way to the top. You don't need to, you just have it about halfway. That's all they need to go. And you can put, uh, start with a pound of worms, which is about a thousand worms. Uh, you can put less in there if you want. Here you can see I've moistened it. I usually, when I start off, I moisten, adding a little bit of water at a time, about two to one ratio, but you just, Feel it by hand to the point where there's no water in the bottom, but it's it's nice and moist for everything else because some of the paper and some of the brown paper in particular will gradually soak up that additional moisture and it becomes this nice even bit of moisture. You put the worms in there whenever you want to feed them. If you want to put in whole vegetables or uh, food scraps, you can do that. Just dig in one area put them in there, cover them up with a, um, an inch or two of material. And then you might wanna put a marker like a plastic spoon or something just in one corner. So you know, well, that was the last place I fed and then you can feed in a different thing. Since I puree the food that I put in, I just dig a trench right in the middle, put down the a couple of spoonfuls of food for them, pureed food, and then cover it up and then do the same thing the next day or so. One of the other things I do to keep the texture of everything nice and even is every week I'll turn the entire pile with my hands because over time, the small stuff filters down to the bottom and uh, becomes a little bit more aerobic. But if you just mix it up, it makes us not, it's like turning your big compost pile and turning this little one, keeps everything a nice even texture and the worms don't seem to mind at all and they do really well. Now, what will happen is in eight weeks, for my case, they'll take all this stuff and they'll turn it into vermicast and you can tell that it's done. It's about eight weeks for me and it will have all the paper, all the newspaper and everything, you won't see that anymore. It's just this nice black vermicast. It has that nice earthy smell I mentioned before. And now I've got to now take that and get the worms out of it and put the worms in fresh bedding so we can start the process all over again. So how do you, how do I do that or how might you do that? Well, the way I do this in my system that I've got if I actually put, I have another tub that I'll put on top of a new tub. So let's say this is a new tub and it's all ready to go. And I actually have some food in here and it's covered up. It's a, attracted. One thing I forgot to mention is I also put a handful of sand in there or you put dirt or whatever. And that, uh, those little particles, the playground sand or any type of dirt, uh, fine. The worms have a gizzard and they take those particles and they use that to grind up the food. So when I put that down uh, in there, so it's all ready to go. And then I have another plastic tub, which I've cut the bottom out, as you can see here. And then I put a, a grid that's a quarter inch mesh and the worms can crawl through this. <clears throat> so it's just big enough to allow them to crawl through and then after I do that, I take the old vermicast that they've gone through and I pile that in there, emptying out one bucket. And now I can use that new bucket to put in for the next time around. And then here you can see it all assembled. And then I'll put this out in the sun. And what happens when I put it out in the sun is the worms don't like light. So you want, that's why you keep it in a shaded area, like in a closet garage or under a shade tree or something like that. I have like a little shed that I built for my worms. I call it Wiggly Field. And the sun 
they don't like the sun. So when I put this out in the sun, it both takes some of the moisture out of the vermicast as well as driving the worms down into the new, the new bedding that's down in this bucket. And so I can scrape off a little bit of a time uh, over the course of a day or so, and it'll all be there in driving all the worms down into the new bedding. And after that's done, we start the whole process over again in eight weeks. Another way you can do this, if you want, is simply lay out a piece of plastic or one of those blue tarps that you see um, available. And then the worms, again, in the sun, the sun's going to drive them towards the center and you just scrape around the edges, getting the good vermicast. Or you could even take the screen and if it's not too wet, you can just shake it and the worms are too big to go through in a normal sifting through the quarter inch mesh, they uh, some might fall through, but not uh, a whole lot because you're shaking it back and forth. And that's a quick way of doing it as well. Although I like doing it this way, uh, the way that I have, because I, I know that I'm getting not so many worms falling through. So that's a, another way the commercial people, that's what they do is they use uh, some some form of screening in order to make that happen. But this way is very popular for a lot of people. If you're not doing a lot of them, just doing this and then pulling it away until it gets closer. And then that's about it. That's all you have to do for vermicasting. The, they're very hardy. You can go away on vacation. Just give them some food before you take off. If you're gone for a week, even two weeks, they usually will have no problems. Worse comes to worse. Nobody has ever been sent to jail for killing a worm. So it's a great way of doing it. It's just a no-brainer. I encourage everybody to get into uh, vermiculture and composting with worms. The food scraps that you have, once again, you can puree them or you can just put them in whole. And one thing to remember is anything that you have in your kitchen, even though you think it's yucky, or maybe it's got mold on it or something because it's a, a lettuce that you left in the fridge too long or something, that's perfect for composting, whether it's regular composting or vermicomposting. They love that stuff. That's their whole job is to decompose it even further. So. Don't throw that stuff away, compost it. So you've got some benefits of composting. It's great for your things. It helps keep things out of the landfill, minimizes our impact on the environment. You've got those different methods that you can use. Vermicomposting, I really would encourage everybody to do. And just do what works best for you because you just, there's no wrong way to compost. It's going to happen regardless. It's just whether it happens quickly and real efficiently or at its own leisurely thing. If you have those worm beds, you can just leave them in the ground and then gradually grab stuff. But once again, you just put it in until the bedding sort of goes away and then put fresh bedding in. Very easy to do composting. Okay, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Greg. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed the, the presentation. Um, we didn't get too many via the chat. It was mostly um, with a good couple of comments. Um, one of them was that Irvine Way Services has, has said that um, residents are not allowed to put compost materials into the yard bin. Um, Greg, have you heard anything in regards to that? Are not allowed to put compost materials into the yard bins. What are yard bins? Into the into the into the waste the, the waste bins. They're not allowed to put compost materials into the green bins. You mean? Yeah, into the green bins exactly. I'm not sure exactly what's 
They're saying that's the whole purpose of those green bins is to put plant material for composting. Yeah, I, I just think it's more. I think um, maybe maybe like orange peels and stuff like that. I know some some uh, some cities don't allow certain materials in. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, you want to pay attention. Like like I mentioned, the palm fronds and stuff like that. A lot of people like take their leaves and they put them in a plastic bag and put them in the the green waste. And you don't want to do that. You just want to put the leaves in there and stuff. Um, if you've generated compost, I can see where they don't want you to put that in there. But if you if you went through all the trouble to make your own compost. I would use it around the yard or you can use it in your house plants. That's another nice thing about vermicomposting is that small amount. If you just have pots or plants because uh, indoor plants or whatever, you can mix that into the top area of your soil and you can create just enough that it's gives your plants a, a really healthy. Uh, sure. Just with anything, everybody, just make sure you check with your, um, if you're not in the Irvine district, uh, just check with the local uh, moist services to see what can be put into the green bins. Right. Uh, let's see. Another question that came in, Greg, was about uh, regarding coffee grounds. Uh huh. So with with uh, cold brewing is very popular now. So I believe when when cold brew happens, a lot of the um, oils um, it doesn't excrete a lot of the oils and acids because of the cold brew process. Right. Affect anything in regards to vermicomposting? Um. The okay. The nice thing is that our soils and that uh, tend to be acidic, and when so if you can put our I'm sorry our our soils tend to be alkaline and our water IRWD will be able to tell you this is alkaline. So plants like the soil to be right at neutral pH or slightly acidic. So if we can put something in like a slightly acidic um, compost, that helps out things. And that's one of the main reasons why people will put coffee grounds in. Mm -hmm. The worms do not like really acidic things, but they, they seem to be okay with coffee grounds. I, I just do a normal brew. I don't do the cold brew. But I will put my coffee grounds in there, but I don't put a whole lot of coffee grounds. It might be 10% of what I pure, it, you know, it gets put in, but it's like 10% of the kitchen scraps and vegetable scraps that I use for my vermicomposting. Sure. So it's, it's um, a smaller amount. I used to use as part of my bedding peat moss, which is very acidic, but doing some reading on the literature in that in the past year, I found out that they don't like, that's a little too acidic for them. And it never, I mean, I've been doing verma com, uh, composting for years and years and years. And I, I never noticed, you know, them really stressing out. But based on that, I no longer put peat moss in as part of my bedding material. It's just other, uh, other compost, which going through the worms makes it even better, as well as the brown and white paper material okay. that's shredded. Uh, does bring up a good point. You you want to avoid anything that you would avoid for a regular compost pile. You also want to avoid anything that's extremely acidic, like orange rinds, lemon, stuff like that, for, for the worms. They can go okay. in your regular compost pile just fine. And once again, that'll make your compost a little bit more acidic. But avoiding uh, really acidic stuff for the worms. Okay, um, now everybody just remember that we are gonna be responding to these questions. You know, questions come into the chat feature. We will address them if we don't get to them now. We still have a little bit of time. Um, and I think the, the last question that we did receive, uh, Greg, was is there any difference in composting for citrus trees? Composting for citrus trees yes. or citrus matter? I think it's, it's composting for citrus trees. Not, uh, not really. The you know, you want to use compost in general. You can take the finer material, mix that into your soil around the base of the tree, any tree really. Sure. And then put 
bigger materials because the air needs to flow. Once again, you want that air to get down. So larger pieces of either composted or just ground up plant material, which we put on top as a mulch, and that can be up to six inches deep. It'll be bigger chunks, but that once again, helps keep weeds down, helps keep the ground soil, keeps moisture in, <clears throat> so uh, prevents evaporation of uh, the irrigation. So that 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 all works really well. Nothing in particular as far as, I mean, I use the exact same compost on my citrus trees. I have seven citrus trees at my home. As I do my stone fruits, my fig trees, everything else, it's um, pretty much the same thing. As far as the actual composting, once again, I won't put oranges or lemons or anything like that in for the worms. I won't puree that for the worms or, or stick it in as just regular vegetables, but I will put in, uh, I will put them into my uh, compost that I'm going to be making the, through the classic way. Mm -hmm. And that will make the soil a little bit more acidic, which once again, we need in our area because the soil is alkaline and water tends to be alkaline. Right. Thank you, Greg. Um, for those Thank you so much. We're going to just be yeah, honest. There's one more question that came in. We'll go ahead and, and address this question. And then after we will be um, completing, uh, coming to an end with the workshop. Uh, Greg, so the question says, can you use everything that's suggested that's suggested for worm composting as you do for other composting? Or do you primarily add material from food, uh, vegetables, eggshells, fruits, and their peelings, etc.? Um, everything that's used for worm composting you can use in your regular compost pile. However, with vegetable scraps, Usually what you want to do is you want to bury them a couple inches deep in your compost pile. Otherwise, you will get more insect problems and rodents and various things like that, which will go after the vegetable scraps. That's another reason why I like pureeing it for the for the worms is that I don't worry I, I don't get weed seed or like tomato seeds or watermelons prop popping up inside my my worm bin it sure. uh, works a little better that way okay well let's again and, and eggs are a good addition as well they provide calcium and if you puree them it puts it in a form that the worms can also use uh, in lieu of the sand as a, a form of grit okay uh, one more question uh, Greg mm -hmm. uh, do you ever add nitrogen or blood meal I do when I'm using my compost. When I blend my compost and that, I'll add, I'll supplement some fertilizers, but that is not part of the composting mechanism. If yeah. you need to kickstart your compost pile with uh, nitrogen, the two best sources, <clears throat> once, as I mentioned, coffee grounds are an excellent source. Of course, green leaves and grass, if you've got it, anything that's green. The other thing is that the, the mash that's used for beer, I don't have a brewery nearby me that I've hit up for that, but apparently that's also an excellent source of a nitrogen material, and it's sort of like a, a off-white type thing, so you can use that as well. Okay. Okay, with that said, I think we, are, we came to an end. Um, I thank you once again, Greg. I mean, what a fantastic presentation. I'd like to thank you and the Master Gardeners of Orange County for putting on this uh, great workshop. And everybody, uh, look forward. Uh, look, uh, you can always go to our Rightscape, um, rightscapenow.com uh, website for upcoming workshops. We have workshops on a monthly basis. Um, with that, thank you, Greg, once again. And thank, thank you everybody for joining us. And we'll hopefully see you at the next workshop. Greg, if you can stay on, that'll be fine. Yeah, that'll be fine. Yeah, it was funny. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day.